Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today. I am Kenneth Barrientos. Um, I work at UNESCO Univoc, and I am currently leading our work on SDGs and Greening Tibet. UNESCO Univoc is one of the conference coalition partners of the World Skills International, and we coordinate a network of Tibet organizations in UNESCO member states. So we are very grateful to World Skills International for providing this platform to share the experiences of some of our network members in the region. I will be co-moderating today's session with my colleague, um, Mr. Robert Perua, Program Specialist in our UNESCO Beijing Cluster Office. This session is part of the Skills for Green Jobs track. And for those of you wondering, this track aimed at reviewing um, what has been achieved in greening of Tibet systems and institutions, and to see how the pandemic has impacted this movement. Next slide, please. Today's session will explore the job-rich opportunities in the green transition. We have very interesting initiatives that are taken in the region to seize these opportunities of implementing climate change solutions that are econo ecologically sound, economically viable, and also inclusive for the society using Tibet mechanisms. We designed this showcase discussion with contributions from our expert panelists today, consistent with our aims to drive a holistic implementation of education for sustainable development and greening Tibet agenda, and also to mobilize greater engagement of TVET with partners in creating demand-driven and green-oriented programs, policies, and approaches. I think these agendas are common and complementary with our organizing partners for this session, which are UNIDO and World Skills International. So before we proceed, I just want to share three housekeeping information. Uh, first, the Q&A function is activated for participants to ask questions at any point in time. You can find this tool at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Interpretation is also available if you want to switch between English and Chinese. The complete profiles of our experts can be found on the session page of the uh, World Skills Conference. To manage our time, we will not introduce our well accomplished experts in great lengths, but you can find all the information on the session page. Third, the panel will run for one hour and 15 minutes, so let us try to adhere to the time allocations for all the speakers. I will now pass on the floor to my colleague Robert for more information about our session. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, part, uh, participants. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists. Our panelists are Richard, uh, Ricardo Savogliano from UNIDO. Janaka Jayalath, uh, Brian Butanes, Martin Stotele, and Andrian Ang. Uh, it is a distinct pleasure to introduce to you what we have in store for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, UNESCO, Beijing office, and Univox Center are very pleased to uh, be a partner to uh, World Skills and UNIDO in uh, hosting this session today. We're indeed very proud, uh, very happy to uh, partner uh, and engage in the World Skills Conference 2021 under the theme, uh, Road Ahead, Skills for a Resilient Future. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce to you what we have in store for you today. For the first segment, we have very interesting showcase to be presented by the Chief of Agro-Industries, and Skills Development Division of UNIDO. Uh, Ricardo will share with us some very interesting uh, models and projects and approaches that UNIDO uh, is doing and, and with industry partners in the region. We will see how they have adopted working um, align in, an, in alignment with the frameworks and platforms to ensure environmental sustainability, green skills, industrial development in some of the uh, Asian countries, and also aligned with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, with specific focus on uh, SDG4, quality education, SDG8, 
and SD13 uh, on climate action. We will also learn how these projects, uh, UNIDO projects, uh, have shaped and contributed to skills demand and uh, green economy. Uh, Ricardo's input will be followed by three experts who are responsible for the design and implementation of initiatives meant to respond to different types of emerging or developing green skills demand. We have very interesting examples of skills and development and industry engagement and approaches in TVET to prepare the workforce for green transition and green economy. Uh, in Singapore, uh, from Sri Lanka uh, and Indonesia. Towards the end of our session today, ladies and gentlemen, we will hear from a TVET center or institution in the Philippines to reflect and share upon our training, sustainability and partnerships are organized with communities during the pandemic. Without further ado, I now invite Ricardo Savigliano to uh, make his presentation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, thank you, UNESCO, for the excellent uh, cooperation over the last uh, uh, few weeks. And thank you for World Skills International for having invited us to actually to, to cooperate together. That was a, has been a very interesting journey so far. So um, um, I see that the slides, uh, or maybe if you can help me with, because we prepared some some slides that we like we would like to uh, to propose. Um, anyway, before doing into the slides, uh, I would like just to say that UNIDO, as a specialized agency of the United Nations for the uh, industrial development, is a kind of custodian also of the SDG nine. Which is uh, with calls of uh, on uh, sustainable industrial development, inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So in that position, we have the unique uh, advantage, let's say, uh, to work very closely with the private sector, uh, which is actually our driver for 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 thinking, for innovate, uh, also in the area of uh, skills development. So we have many projects, many uh, approaches. Uh, which are trying to get inspiration from the private sector in what we with, uh, we normally know as a demand uh, um, oriented demand skills um, uh, development. So today we opted to showcase two examples of cooperation with the private sector, uh, just to highlight the way, uh, as I said, uh, uh, we stimulate uh, uh, the, 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 and we get support uh, um, from the private sector in terms of uh, uh, skills, uh, skills development program. Um, we hope that these two cases will give you uh, some, some good elements for discussion. So the first one uh, is related to a partnership with a leading, uh, let's say, global manufacturer of uh, air conditioning appliances. And the name is uh, uh, Midea, is based in China. And uh, I would like on that to, in that regard, to launch a video. If you can please move the presentation one slide uh, more, should be a video for you. Thank you. to a natural refrigerant, such as R290 with negligible global warming potential. 
but this process is not as simple as it sounds. Propylene is a flammable substance that requires qualified technicians to be able to safely install, service, and maintain these air conditioners. We are now ready to bring environmentally friendly ACs to the global market. But if we want to increase the update worldwide, we need to have trained engineers and technicians at local and global level and invest in the reskilling and upskilling. So, thank, thank you so much. So basically, the first uh, <clears throat> the first case uh, is related to um, to the Montreal Protocol. I don't know whether you are familiar with that. But the Montreal Protocol is the treaty uh, which is uh, which aims at, at uh, protecting uh, the ozone layer. Um, so here we talk about. Uh, something that comes from the 70s and then got uh, many steps uh, until today and many successes and many still challenges uh, uh, ahead of us. So um, uh, the Montreal Protocol, it must be, um, let's say, highlighted, was based uh, in the 70s uh, on the precautionary principle. So uh, when the, 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 the environmental issue was uh, identified, uh, uh, the causes were were um, were um, uh, also identified, and uh, actions were taken uh, with the principle of uh, uh, engaging at global level with that uh, precautionary principle. So, and then another very important element is that the Montreal Protocol and uh, the Vienna Convention before is based on shared but differentiated responsibilities. So, those elements and also the successes brought the, the, um, the Montreal Protocol and the Vienna Convention to be the first environmental treaty uh, to reach the universal ratification. So every country in the world decided to engage into that, uh, uh, into that uh, treaty. And UNIDO is part of that. Uh, it's part of that. Um, we are working with, uh, with uh, governments, with private sectors uh, and industries to phase out uh, those uh, uh, substances which are depleting the ozone layer. Uh, most recently, in 2016, uh, the Montreal Protocol was also, uh, let's say, tasked to reduce uh, uh, the emission of uh, some uh, chemicals uh, which are not affecting the ozone layer, but uh, affecting the climate primarily. So the Montreal Protocol has, uh, in, with the Kigali Amendment, uh, was tasked to reduce uh, the use of HFCs. I mean, for those uh, uh, with technical knowledge, um, we, we, I mean, it's easy to, to understand the message, but uh, again, the, the video was calling about a revolution, and this is actually what is happening. It's happening at the level of uh, uh, Montreal Protocol, but the companies. Next slide, please. And that evolution, revolution, is, as I said, uh, uh, being inspired by, by the private sector. So since 10 years, uh, uh, UNIDO is working uh, in this case, uh, in this specific case with uh, MIDEA. MIDEA is really a, a huge player uh, in the global market of uh, air conditioning systems, in particular those small ones. I mean, the one that we saw, uh, the one with the unit outside our windows. Uh, and uh, by implementing this technology that's been developed, uh, the video showed that we can achieve uh, um, the three percent, uh, the three zero, sorry, zero point three uh, degrees centigrade, uh, which is, uh, I mean, very actual uh, debate now in the, the Glasgow meeting. Uh, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, impact. So the saving that uh, has been uh, calculated is nine trillion tons of CO two equivalent. So it's equivalent to a car driving from Neptune to the sun. So it's we are talking really about. Uh, huge magnitudes. But that technology, that specific technology, has uh, uh, shortcomings, has some difficulties, some barriers. 
One is the one of them is a flammability, uh, making the installation, making the, the the maintenance of those uh, units a little bit uh, more uh, tricky. And for that, uh, we are not talking about impossible things to do. But for that, we need to train people. We need to have uh, people skilled to handle that technology. Next slide, please. So Unido and Midea worked in the past uh, to make sure that at the level of the manufacturing that uh, flammable substance can be handled properly. I mean, that's not a big issue because industries are handling even much more difficult substances. So on the manufacturing line, that is not an issue. But uh, again, those eco-friendly technologies, though are very high efficient, need, as I said, uh, trained uh, technicians to, 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 to handle it. And let me say, in China, Midea has done a tremendous work together with the government to train the people. But there was a recent study done by the European Association of Refrigeration, this area, where they are saying that only three, between 3 and 5 and 7 percent of the current European technicians handling uh, air-conditioned units are able to handle flammable refrigerants. That means that in Europe, there is a, a tremendous need for reskill and upskills of those technicians to reach out a level where the market could take, um, could take the technology. So the area is calling for mandatory certification, for instance, because I mean, could be dangerous for the technicians itself, could be dangerous for end users. Huh? If, if the technician, if the, um, let's say, if the technology is not uh, properly handled. And again, let me say here, we are talking about a revolution that could help the international community to reduce by 0.3 degrees Celsius centigrade uh, the, the, the rates of uh, uh, global warming. So again, it's something that uh, has a huge magnitude in terms of impact. So next slide, please. Let me refer to another example where again, uh, UNIDO and the private sector are uh, very much working together. It's the case of the eco-industrial park. So, eco-industrial parks uh, are to be considered as a, how to say, agglomeration of companies producing goods and services, and that agglomeration is done in an organic and synergic manner. So, those companies are uh, sharing locations, infrastructures, and uh, also utilities and services. So, that's a, um, in front of you, you have a diagram where, where you can see a bit uh, um, an, an explanation on, 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 on that approach. Next slide, please. So to become an eco-industrial park, an industrial park has to demonstrate higher standards on environmental and social responsibilities. And um, the concept of eco-industrial park is based on resource efficiency, right? and reuse of waste, um, but including energy and also materials. So the approach calls for a continuous improvement of, uh, of partners and companies uh, to, to towards uh, um, efficiency and uh, reduction of risks, both on humans and uh, environment. Ricardo, so if, yes, please. You have one, one minute to wrap up, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going into the case of Indonesia. If you want to move it uh, forward, please. Next slide. It's the case of Indonesia where basically the Eco Industrial Park has a, a TVET center located inside, uh, the, inside the facility. When I was talking about uh, the, the importance of sharing services, in this case, uh, we have a VET uh, school within the park. So it's a park with 330 companies, and there is a school training students and making them with the proper skills uh, to approach uh, the industries. If you go to the next slide, just to give you the, the final flavor, this is the last uh, slide of mine. 80% of uh, graduated from the school are, uh, let's say, are employed by those companies. 
And uh, partners are very known, uh, very well known locally, but also internationally. So we have uh, cases of uh, entrepreneurship uh, support, but uh, uh, apprenticeship programs also abroad uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Japan, and so on and so forth. So just to say, to, uh, to, to, to conclude my presentation, I would like to, to, to highlight three uh, trends. New occupations and related qualifications are uh, needs, basically, uh, skill, um, let's say, profiles to enter, uh, let's say, new economies, uh, new economies, so the green, greener economies. Uh, there is a need to reintegrate workers in those, uh, in those declining sectors. Um, and uh, again, greening is an opportunity, um, definitely an opportunity uh, to create, uh, to create uh, jobs. And the important is that the private sector is uh, um, in the picture fully since the beginning of, of, of that process. Thank and you. Robert, with that, I turn it back to you and I yes. thank you for the chance to talk. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, for your excellent presentation of the two uh, examples in of UNIDO's work in uh, China and in um, in Indonesia. I will pose you only two questions uh, for you to answer. Um, so the first um, first question: How is the protocol of these projects influencing decisions of policy, influencing policy to adopt different uh, shades of greenness in terms of jobs and tasks in the sectors addressed by the project. The second question is, how do you observe our trends in the level or profile of TVET skills that are, de that are in demand in jobs when new um, green technologies are introduced? You have the floor, please, uh, Ricardo. Thank you, Robert. Uh, both cases are actually um, have been proposed because they have a very high, let's say, impact on policies. No? Um, I was mentioning both uh, the Montreal Protocol, but also the, the, the Eco-Industrial Parks are uh, cases where governments are very, let's say, in, let me say, in the driving seat, right? They are the ones uh, uh, moving, moving the, the um, uh, let's say the the line of uh, of uh, development. For Montreal Protocol, there is not uh, a specific need. Uh, I mean, a specific focus on job creation. Uh, there is a the focus is on environmental protection. So you don't have uh, uh, on that uh, treaty a very specific uh, specific focus on jobs. But uh, all the Montreal Protocol projects are relying on TVET schools. And then maybe, I mean, I'm sure that we have several of the participants today or the audience uh, from the schools where the curricula on, uh, on uh, air conditioning and refrigerations are part of uh, the services they provide. What I'm saying is that even those CVs, curricula should look into the future, the future of technologies, with the technologies which are now or developed since 10 years and going to be in the, in the market in the next five or 10 years. That is going to be very important because technicians trained today will find a job with technologies which are going to be different in, 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 in five years from now. So, and that brings me to the second point, uh, how the TVET system should consider those technologies. Uh, and the development of those technologies. It's really important, I think, uh, that uh, every single VET uh, schools, uh, through their governments, of course, uh, keep an eye on those mega trends uh, happening uh, globally in terms of technology development. We are not only talking about uh, uh, green green jobs, we are talking about also uh, digital jobs. We, we know the tremendous numbers uh, telling us uh, how different the job market will look like you know, in terms of uh, in, in few years from now because of digitalization. So TVET systems should uh, be absolutely linked with those megatrends. And uh, who can do that? I mean, 
of course, UNESCO, um, uh, but also partnering with UNIDO, partnering with, uh, I mean, it must be a table um, embracing uh, many, many different, uh, different uh, let's say, actors. In our opinion, as a UNIDO, the industry, in particular, those one, the, the, those industries investing in future of uh, future technologies must be there to inspire us. I'm not sure, Robert, whether I answered. I, I hope so. Otherwise, I would be more than happy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. I now pass the floor on to um, uh, Ken for the next segment, please. Thank you, um, Robert and Ricardo for that wonderful part um, that you have uh, organized. So we will now move on to the second part of the discussion. And this is about the showcase of Tibet systems and institutions in the region. So how they are responding to these demands, new mega trends and technological revolutions. Um, I invite Dr. Janaka Jayalat who will uh, start off the presentation. He is the Deputy Director General of the Technical and Vocational Education Commission in Sri Lanka. And before that, he has been engaged as Director of Information Systems for many years. Janaka, um, so you have five minutes for this. Uh, we will manage the Q&A right after. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken, and uh, thank you, Robert. And thank you for giving me this opportunity, the World Skills and uh, UNESCO UNWOC. And uh, my presentation uh, is in two parts. First part is uh, the policy review and uh, how to modeling uh, the stakeholder engagement in, in Tibet. Uh, and uh, the second part, I'm going to give some two examples from uh, construction and uh, energy sector, how we applied the uh, greening elements in the curriculums. Uh, this, these are the two uh, things that we have been uh, practicing in our sector. Next slide, please. So give you some uh, brief introduction. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you know the Asian cultures uh, inherit the greening concepts uh, because uh, most of the Asian cultures are with the, the environment and uh, they know how to save the environment and uh, they, they think that this is an asset and uh, most of the rural sector covers like 70 percent of uh, the, mostly the agriculture which uh, is largely involved with uh, the greening concepts uh, from the, the tradition. And uh, actually, greening uh, Tibet helps the uh, environment. Uh, and uh, we have very conscious about these practices. Uh, and the urban population uh, has been a reason for damaging some of the environment. And uh, there are a lot of uh, litigations and various regulations uh, in uh, regulating these uh, environmental hazards and various uh, things. And also there's a motivation from various uh, export-oriented companies as they are corporate social responsibility to save the nature. And uh, there's a new concept called greening workforce. Uh, this because earlier people thought that uh, greening concepts are more costly. And now people uh, get uh, realize that greening is more uh, less costly and more profitable and more productive. And uh, this has uh, changed the people's mindset uh, towards the, the implementing the greening. In Sri Lanka also, uh, we, we are trying to seize the opportunities uh, for job creation and skills development in green sectors like, like uh, PV TV, photovoltaic, and uh, waste disposal, and various other aspects. And uh, we try to uh, give more opportunities for the disadvantaged groups through the greening skills, and a lot of opportunities have been created through that. And also, the small and medium scale industries uh, create some of the issues, and we try to give uh, separate skills development and greening element. Uh, 
the trainer training and various other programs and the different uh, ministries to uh, reduce that. And when we go to the policy level, uh, we have a green incubate policy and uh, labor market forecasting and uh, Tibet planning, which is the, the planning tool uh, which we are going to implement the development plan. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, if we take the coverage, mainly uh, there are individuals who uh, are in the business and SME sector and some of the government corporates, uh, government and corporate businesses who are in the and the greening sector. Next slide, please. Uh, when we consider the ecosystem of uh, greening Tibet, uh, we have green NCS, greening NCS, and uh, greening curriculums. We have various curriculum elements. And uh, there's activity delivery organizations, uh, greening uh, practices in the workplaces, and uh, green workforce when they go to the jobs and markets and uh, thereby improve the productivity. And all this leads to sustainable development. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the two examples where uh, the greening uh, elements covered in the energy sector, where uh, most of the, the exposed, exposed gas are controlled and regulated in different uh, occupations like boiler operator, electric motor binder, electrician, uh, and linesman, various other jobs, which has environmental uh, concerns, disposal management, energy conservation, like this. Next slide, please. Uh, this is some of other occupation, rep and air conditioning mechanic, which has various uh, aspects for greening and uh, how to control the ozone layer, uh, how to protect uh, the environment and various other aspects in greening concepts. Next slide, please. This is the second sector, construction sector, which is very much involved in greening uh, methods and practices, aluminum fabricator, uh, quantity survey, construction draftman, how to do the uh, en environment protection and various other regulations in the sector. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, some of the other construction uh, related uh, occupations, construction site supervisor, wood craftsman, bar bender, all these are, there are grading elements which is taught in uh, training centers to be implemented in workplaces. And this is, uh, we use in the assessments to see whether these uh, Tibet students are complied and conform to these standards. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we have incorporated the, all these screening concepts and practices into the development plan, which covers mainly the, the traditional crafts to new technology, right, of robotic and mechatronic. And uh, all the spectrum is covered with the greening concepts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janaka, for sharing with us the policy initiatives that are linked with the um, skills forecasting uh, efforts that uh, you are leading at TVEC. So uh, we are two or three minutes behind time. So I will come back to you, Janaka, for the quest follow up questions later. Perhaps we will move along and I will invite Dr. Ang. He is the senior manager of the Integrative Built Environment Center um, in Singapore Temasek Polytechnic. He is a trainer and associate faculty at the Newcastle University for the MSc program on energy and sustainability and accredited lead professional. So Dr. Ang will share with us the initiative that they are doing at uh, Temasek Polytechnic, which I believe is at the heart of the greening Tibet uh, strategy in the in the Polytechnic. Dr. An, we invite you Thank to you. please come in. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak at this conference. So um, in the next few minutes, I'll be walking you through on how the Master Polytechnic curates its curriculum to better equip our graduates with lifelong learning and relevant work-ready skills. In particular, the curriculum from the Built Environment Cluster from the School of Engineering. 
Now, climate change is a global challenge and Singapore is taking firm actions to do our part to build a sustainable future. Therefore, we have a whole of nation movement to advance Singapore's national agenda on sustainable movement known as the Singapore Green Plan 2030. Now, this Green Plan charts ambitious and concrete target over the next 10 years, strengthening Singapore's commitment under the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and Paris Agreement, and positioning us to achieve long-term net zero emission aspiration as soon as possible. Can we have the next slide, please? The next slide, please. Thank you. Now, so in Tamasic Polytechnic, we are very aligned with the government's initiative. So sustainability at TP it is supported by four main pillars, and they are basically the four Cs, community, campus, collaborations, and curriculum. Now, for community itself, we have a staff-led TP Eco Campus Committee and a green interest group led by our students to help promote sustainability effort on campus and the community around our campus too. Now, Tomasi Polytechnic is a campus that sits on about 30 hectares of land and we strive to be the greenest campus in Singapore. So there are some initiatives that we have adopted and these are basically, for example, harvesting of rainwater to irrigate plants on campus. For the new buildings constructed within the campus itself, we embrace green designs and adopt green technologies. Some of the buildings are already using solar panels to harvest energy from the sun to help offset our electricity usage, which in return reduces our carbon footprint. As for collaborations, there are also various research centers known as centers of excellence in Tomasic Polytechnic, and they are developed in collaborations with our industry partners to tap on each other's expertise and exchange ideas on new technologies for greener buildings. Lastly, we have curriculum. There are basically um, two diplomas within the built environment cluster within the School of Engineering. And in the built environment field, sustainability is the keyword in the designing and building of cities in today's digital economy. Hence, with a strong conviction in mind, a dedicated team of experienced educators with their rich industry experience from various fields, ranging from engineering to architecture, created a curriculum on designing integrated high-performance building using technologies that enable us to make buildings more sustainable and resistant to environmental degradation. This diploma is known as the Architectural Technology and Building Services. Now, as Singapore moves towards becoming a more sustainable and smart nation, we are also looking at equipping our students with the necessary multidisciplinary skill sets to become a professional who manages the integration of building systems, processes, and smart technologies to enhance the overall management of building facilities. These will be offered in the Diploma in Integrated Facility Management. Apart from creating for pre-employment trainings, we are also encouraging our adult learners to upgrade their skill sets through continuous education and training courses in the form of specialist diploma and short courses. Now, the specialist diploma in energy management and sustainable design will equip our adult learners with the knowledge of various building systems and develop competency in sustainable design concepts. So recently, we launched a regulatory course with our government agencies, National Environmental Agency, known as the Refrigerant Handling for Technician course. Now, this is the first of its kind in Singapore, and it is in line with the amendments to the Environment Protection and Management Bill passed in Singapore on the 13th of September, 2021. So let me briefly share with you on how this regulatory course conceptualized using the three I's block shown on this slide. The three I's are basically identifying, integrate, and implement. In 2020, NEA, which is the National Environment Agency, shared with the Marseille Polytechnic that in line with the new bill, chiller technicians has been identified, be trained and certified on how to cover and recycle the refrigerant from a chiller, which is to be decommissioned by October 2022. Now, this will be done through regulatory course, and NEA has requested Tomasic Polytechnic to help roll out this course. So moving on to the next block itself, integrate. Now, knowing that this will be a regulatory course and not the usual theory course, we started to engage various stakeholders from government agencies to industry trailer manufacturers and refrigerant recovery companies for their inputs and views on the cost content for this regulatory course. On the last I, implement. Having the right cost without the proper facility and equipment will not lead to the desired outcome for this regulatory cost. And hence, the 
Integrated Build Environment Center in Tomasi Polytechnic has been identified as the training facility for this course, given its unique setup. Now, why is it unique? It is unique as it is equipped with an operational chiller system meant for cooling the facility, as well as for teaching purposes. And the chiller technicians will be trained in this chiller plant room to replicate the actual working environment that they will be working in in future. Next slide, please. So this is an overview on the Integrative Build Environment Center in terms of the causes that we have. In short, we call it IBAC. This is one of the latest addition to the Center of Excellence in Tomasic Polytechnic School of Engineering. Now, equipment ranging from security system to chiller system in these centers are all operational. And at the same time, we can use it for hands-on realistic training purposes. This is to promote a broader model of learning, which comprises a complex integration of knowledge, skills, actions, in order to carry out a task successfully in the real-life context. This will provide both our CET and PET students with a realistic learning environment. Next slide, please. Now, so, so these are some of the regulatory causes that we are currently offering in IBEC, from operational lift and escalator costs recognized by our Building Construction Authority to the fire safety manager costs jointly offered by Singapore Civil Defence Force to the chiller plant room for training of the refrigerant handling for technician costs jointly offered by national environment agencies. With all these examples that we are showcasing here, in TP itself, in Tamasic Polytechnic, we pride ourselves in our ability to nurture minds and ignite passions for lifelong learning. With that, I thank you for your attention. Over to you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ang. That was indeed uh, a very uh, good example of a specific strategy to incorporate uh, uh, green skills in the curriculum. Perhaps I just have two quick follow-up questions, if you can help us uh, elaborate a little bit. Uh, both to Janaka and Dr. Ang, um, what are the lessons that we are drawing from these examples that you have shared with us? So for example, um, Dr. Janaka shared with us uh, labor market information-oriented policies. Um, do you think the institutions, the, the Tibet institutions in Sri Lanka, are getting the right information at the right time? And are we, um, do, you, do we think the efforts we are doing is enough? Or what improvements are we expecting to further uh, provide timely information? For Dr. Ang, perhaps you can give us also some lesson um, in terms of how you are replicating these strategies with other potential uh, green programs that you will be launching at Temasek Polytechnic. Janaka, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ken. Actually, uh, this is a very important uh, question whether these policies have been implemented. Uh, actually, uh, when the industry says uh, that they need this kind of uh, greening uh, technology, how to save the energy, how to do the environment, uh, uh, how to apply greening concepts in, in the workplace, we have em embed these competencies into the, the national competency standard and thereby uh, national curriculums, competency-based curriculums and assessment resources. So all these are in the curriculums which should be delivered uh, to the students. And, and finally, uh, these competencies are evaluated or uh, checked for the compliances. And uh, after that, only they will be given the certification. So it's uh, basically there's a process and uh, there's a controls, uh, control mechanism over the process to see whether these screening concepts are in uh, uh, practice. Also, when they go to the industry, uh, there are greening concepts uh, already being incorporated in their workshop practices and various op uh, operative uh, practices, business practices. So uh, that is going to be continued. Uh, I think uh, there's a room for improvement for this screening concept. Still, uh, uh, we need uh, a lot of effort uh, to cover the SME sector. Thank you. Thanks so much. Dr. Adrian, please. All right. Okay, so um, to answer your question, um, I have two parts. One is basically for our pre-employment training, and the other is actually for our continuous educational training. Now, for the pre-employment training itself, students will basically um, go through a three-year diploma program. 
So uh, with that, we, we as educators, we need to be actually forward looking because um, eventually when students graduate, it's going to be three years time. And with that, the technology, um, the policies, uh, all will change in that, at, that, at that point of time when students actually hit the workforce. So therefore, we will have to actually be forward looking and plan ahead and make sure that whatever that we teach are actually relevant and not just relevant, but they are something that we envision that will happen subsequently in the future. In terms of continuous educational training, um, we are training adult learners who are back on campus to actually upgrade their skill sets to meet the requirements of the industry. So for IBAC, which is the Integrative Field Environment Centre itself, we are a centre not just within the campus, but we have strong links with more than 10 industry partners as well as government agencies. And through all these links, we are able to actually um, get a good sense on what is um, the, the most relevant, relevant in the industry and what is required for the training of this group of um, adult learners. Uh, this centre itself, with the strong links, will also bring back um, um, knowledge and experience to our students during the pre-employment training. So this is basically what uh, we have learned and we are continuously refining um, our approach to um, educate our learners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ang and Dr. Janaka. So both are representing uh, two Univox centers in Asia Pacific region. Um, I will now move on to the next presentation and I would like to invite our next panelist, uh, Mr. Martin Stottel. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So by way of introduction, uh, Martin is the team leader of the project that uh, uh, they're implementing. Before that, Martin was the head of the Swiss Economic Development Corporation at the Embassy of Switzerland in, in Indonesia. And he has worked in several technical operational project management uh, uh, capacities for over 30 years in Switzerland, in Albania. And I think a significant part of that was spent in Indonesia. So Martin, of course, um, is, is very, uh, uh, we are very privileged to have you and to share about your experience implementing the project in Indonesia. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kenneth. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for that opportunity and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody wherever you are sitting at the very moment. The project I am talking about is financed by the government of Switzerland and is implemented in cooperation with three Indonesian ministries, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources, the Ministry of Education and Culture, as well as the Ministry of Manpower. Its name, as it, as it the name hints, the project is focusing on skills development of human resources, particularly in the renewable energy subsector. Next slide, please. Let me give you a little background first. Indonesia has very ambitious targets that are defined at the international stage. 23% renewable energy in the energy mix by 2025 and 41% emission reduction by 2030. That, in case Indonesia is being supported by the international community, otherwise the reduction would be smaller. These are aggressive targets which will not be easy to achieve, considering that in 2020 the mix was consisting of 50% coal firepower plants, 29% gas, 6% of the energy was uh, produced by diesel generators and only 15% so far by renewables. There are some preconditions to be successful in that energy transition. Uh, besides the, a conducive regulatory environment, which enhances the private sector investment, the availability of well-skilled and qualified human resources will be essential for the success. The project would like to contribute to achieving these ambitious, ambitious targets by enabling competent design, planning, installation, operation and maintenance of renewable energy power plants in Indonesia through making qualified staff relevant to the labor market needs available. 
the expected results in short of our project are that four polytechnics are offering one-year diploma specialization programs in renewable energy two students from a variety of engineering backgrounds starting 2023 150 students shall graduate at iqf level six which is the equivalent of a bachelor of applied science four training providers shall offer modular shore courses then starting in 22, the training providers shall release 80 graduates annually but at IQF level three or four. And in addition, we expect that at least 10% of the lessons sought in diploma specialization programs and the short courses shall be conducted by guest experts from the industry. Next slide, please. To define the focus of the first phase of the project lasting until mid-25, we looked at which subsectors have the biggest skills demand for the next three to four years and then which ones are most urgent. As a result, we decided to start with solar PV, hydropower and hybrid solar PV diesel generator systems. In the second phase from mid-25 to end-28, the project will most probably address biomass as an additional source of uh, renewable energy. Geothermal energy was purposely excluded as Switzerland has not much experience in the field of geothermal energy. Consequently, the project is working on linking selected training providers to the government of New Zealand as there is significant more experience in geothermal energy in, in New Zealand than in Switzerland. The project will not be able to cover the complete skills demand. Uh, the REST project is intending to develop a meaningful pilot to show an example of good practice basing on which the government and private sector should be able to upscale to achieve the final needs. Next slide, please. The project positions itself within the existing Indonesian formal and non-formal education structure and is aiming at the systemic approach by assisting the development of the so-called D4 courses at IQF level six, graduating with the bachelor's degree in applied science and training the future engineers. And then we have the short courses at IQF level three and four, training the future operation and maintenance personnel. Mr project approach, integration and ownership among the Indonesian partners are intended to be created from the very start of the project. The REST project shall not be a Swiss project, but an Indonesian one, as not to create later the need to integrate something artificial into the Indo Indonesian existing country systems, but from the outset. Uh, create something which fits within to those systems. The core project is assisting the partnering schools and ministries, mainly in curriculum development, in teachers training, in, of tech, in technical as well as methodic and didactic subjects, in teaching material development, equipment investment and training in the use of the equipment, in standards definition and certification, in industrial relations like cooperation in curriculum development, internships, industry representatives, teaching at the selected sessions and job placement. Next slide, please. At the strategic level, the project is working with multiple government partners. Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources as the core partner, then the Ministry of Education and Culture, which is overseeing polytechnic education, and the Ministry of Manpower, which is offering professional training in form of short courses for reskilling or retraining of existing workforce, as well as for high school graduates without experience. High school graduates are, however, the majority of their participants. The BNSP, the National Professional Certification Body, the 
project cooperates with that body in terms of standards definition and certification. Then BAPANAS, the National Planning Ministry, the cooperation there is mainly in the relation to the fact that uh, BAPANAS is in charge of allocating resources to ministries as the equipment investment is split. 50-50 between the government and the project, so it is essential to work with Bapanas as well. The project's implementing partners are 10 training institutions and that relate to private sector in solar and hydropower, as well as the sector associations. The Ministry of Energy and Mineral, uh, Mineral Resources owns two of those schools. One is a polytechnic and one is a training pro provider for short courses. Then the Ministry of Education and Culture has four of those polytechnics we are working with and four training providers of short courses are belonging to the Ministry of Manpower. Next slide, please. That brings me to the end of the short summary of our REST project here in Indonesia. It has only just started nine months ago and we don't have the opportunity to, to talk much about uh, lessons learned yet. But if we have another session in two, three years, we might be able to talk about that. I would like to, to thank you very much for your attention and give back to Kenneth. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, that was really a very interesting uh, showcase of um, how uh, a very comprehensive strategy by the government is uh, leveraging on the opportunity to develop the polytechnic education system in Indonesia, which I think many of you know is very important aspect in, in the country because they really are, are uh, responsible for preparing the workforce for the many industries in the country. Um, maybe not much on the lesson, but maybe what, what strikes me the most is the level of cooperation, how spread out your project is. And of course, that requires you to be working working with a lot of different types of institutions. You have mentioned the training providers for the non-formal education and also the formal education being the polytechnics. Perhaps you can describe it as how um, enthusiastic these polytechnics and training provi providers are in, in working in this project. Um, we don't have to measure, of course, the level of interest. We know it's a very important initiative, but how do you feel um, is, is their, their approach? Is it reflecting a very uh, uh, long-term uh, engagement to the project from, from how you, 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 you see with the partners that you're working with? Thank you. Kenneth, maybe just to your last question about uh, the long-term engagement that the government of Switzerland typically is investing quite into longer-term projects. So the, the project is designed already from the outset for a duration of eight years. Now, talking about the enthusiasm of, of our training providers, when you look at the polytechnics, for many of them, it is actually an opportunity to upgrade uh, three years diploma programs to a four years diploma program by adding uh, a final year, a fourth year of two semesters specializing in the particular sector of renewable energy. Now that makes their school as such a lot more attractive because uh, D4 program in Indonesia is an equivalent to a to a bachelor's degree, so Bachelor of Applied Science, and that is typically what look, what people are looking for to send their, their children to attend a program which is ending it is a, with a bachelor's degree. So for the polytechnics themselves, that is very attractive as an upgrade, upgrading not only one program, but being able to upgrade at the same time various <coughs> programs because um, the intake is taken from these three graduates from various engineering programs by specializing them on renewable energy. Whereas with the short courses, I cannot really say so much yet about, we have not uh, had a, a course yet. The first impression of cooperation with those, with those training providers of the Ministry of Manpower is extremely positive. People are very motivated. There are as well uh, some of the schools they can significantly, significantly enlarge their portfolio of, of, 
of courses being offered, and that makes their, their institution more attractive and is very much welcomed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. That was a really great uh, additional information. So um, I would like to thank all our three presenters. Um, I now uh, give the floor back to Robert, um, who will help us uh, uh, facilitate the question and answer. Robert, please. Your microphone is off. Uh, thank you, Ken. Thank you, uh, our four panelists, for your excellent presentation uh, and sharing your experiences. And we um, will now ask a few questions. Uh, given the essence of time, uh, I will, um, I think, list all, uh, read out the questions. And then you can pick whichever you think is appropriate for you to um, to answer. So the and I think I will also add um, one or two of my um, questions in addition to what we have already um, prepared to ask you. So the first general question to all the panelists: Do you think the skills need to become successful in these projects are being met so far? Second question, what extent of retraining uh, or reskilling of skilled workers uh, are needed? Third, how do you determine the responsibilities between your institutions and your uh, partners? Fourth question, what lessons are you, have you drawn from the experience you have in the project, you have uh, acquired from the project? which can help similar efforts to engage with partners to, for green skills and TVET. Uh, fifth, uh, I think it's very important uh, because of building a, a resilience TVET system. In the context of COVID-19 uh, and in the uh, context of the projects that you have implemented and also the, the systems that you're part of, uh, how have you uh, responded to uh, COVID-19 uh, response. Um, the last one, I think, is on the, um, uh, from your experience, to what extent do you think that the, the institutional culture of greening TVET or green skills uh, has now taken root inside these institutions uh, from, from your experience and from your uh, engagement with partners as well? So uh, thank you um, for those questions. We will now ask, um, firstly, um, Ricardo to start off with uh, your responses to those general questions very quickly. Thank you, Robert. And um, I, I'm not, let me say uh, one, one point. Um, we are lacking at the international level, we are lacking a definition of what a green job is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we are we we don't know what whether whether we will ever achieve a, let's say a, a definition of that uh, and let me say i'm not even sure whether we should invest too much time on that i mean to have a harmonized uh, definition of uh, of that because we have to understand uh, before going into the definition no and work with the words that those technologies looking into, into better use of resources uh, are going to impact our, our daily life in future. And in particular, not only our jobs and the future of jobs, but our daily life. And let me say that is going to, it was very clear from the, from the different, uh, let's say, contributions from today. Uh, there, those technologies are going to impact at different levels those that were before blue collar, white collar, maybe tomorrow will be green collars, right? I mean, at the university level, I don't know. I've ever, I've never heard about the green collar definition, but maybe it could be a, a good outcome from this session, not to call them those engineers and uh, highly educated people on on greener technologies. 
uh, but down to technicians and, and uh, even end users in the end. So we are talking about uh, sometimes uh, uh, new ways of uh, designing cooking stoves, uh, right? For for rural people during uh, using uh, pyrolysis, for instance. I mean, let's leave it outside, but those technologies are going to impact our daily life. And uh, going into um, your element on, on, on whether uh, whether we have to, to which extent to expand you know uh, uh, the technical skills development uh, and the fragile the, the, the fragility of some of the some of the categories we have to consider that uh, people um, not only uh, youth and women will have to be very well educated and be equipped no, with, uh, with uh, skills for their future, but also, uh, let's say, people in the job currently, uh, individuals and also companies, I'm talking about SMEs, for instance, no, which, are, uh, which have different uh, access to, to resources for reskilling, upskilling, those should be protected. And just to say, on that, uh, I think, I mean, partnering uh, at global level is the only is the only solution to be meaningful uh, in, in, in the offers we we may we may provide or we may design. I'm talking about uh, uh, definitely World Skills International is a is a great player on that. No, it's a global, uh, but uh, of course, uh, UNESCO, uh, ILO, UNIDO, all those universities, uh, entities, uh, governmental entities. So. Um, that is going to be to be extremely extremely necessary for the future. I'm not sure, Robert, whether I, I managed to answer any of your questions, but uh, <clears throat> over back to you. Thank you. Uh, I think I want to use the TVET and skills policy is one of the main areas that UNESCO and ILO we address, and I think we need to get a, a very quick feedback from Janaka. You were. You were emphasizing or highlighting on the green skills policy. Uh, please highlight to what extent have you revised the policy or a new policy was developed and also you have to highlight whether you have consulted environment sector, agriculture sector, energy sector, etc. Because you see, our, from our experience, TVET policies are purely designed by ministries of education, excluding the other stakeholders. and. Uh, uh, given the uh, given the new momentum now on green skills, green economy, etc., we need to really uh, revise and up, up, upgrade the TVET policies. Uh, Sanaka, please. Uh, thank you, Robert. I think uh, that is very very timely question because uh, we have, uh, as the policy making and regulatory body for TVET in Sri Lanka. Uh, with the, the support of National Education Commission, which is the, the regulatory and policymaking body for the general education, we have both uh, come together and developed a separate policy for Tibet. So greening is a very much a concern uh, during this development process and how to institutionalize the promotion and environmental uh, friendly and sustainable development goals into the policy was taken into consideration when developing the policy and how to establish a reliable, sustainable teacher education, which is very important that has been given a lot of uh, importance during the policy development. And uh, protection and the rights of the persons with disabilities and how they are, uh, how we incorporate their skills into these sectors uh, in the different uh, segments and uh, to have an inclusive, sustainable uh, development. Uh, as well as uh, when we talk about this, we need the uh, reskilling uh, and upskilling of some of the, the teachers and various other industry uh, persons for the greening uh, skills. And uh, we have two uh, kinds of uh, programs. One is uh, there's also only a protection uh, authority and uh, they have uh, come come to us to develop a separate uh, vocational education training plan for ref ref AC sector. And that is the latest initiative that we have been working uh, with them as uh, the policy for the separate um, 
the, this uh, refinancing sector. Uh, also, uh, yes. Yeah, wrap it up now. Wrap. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, those are some of the examples that we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question, uh, Ken, if you can allow me. The, there's a question from Albania to Martin, uh, our speaker from Indonesia. Uh, the question is uh, of the private sector involvement in the project. How active was it? And which does this cooperation uh, constitute of or comprise of, I think? Martin? Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello from Indonesia to Albania. Hi, Anna. It's a while since we have been working together there. But as a matter of principle, uh, what we are doing in Indonesia is starting the private sector cooperation in the obvious first step, which is the, the curriculum development. So mm -hmm. curriculum development using the DACOM approach, starting with defining the profile of a future graduate together with the private sector, and only then going back to the school and, and starting to, to turn that into a curriculum, reflecting that again with the private sector, um, and seeing if that fits now with their needs, probably revising where necessary. Then we have uh, cooperation in terms of internship. Our students, the, the one-year students, they will attend a three-month internship in the, in the private sector. Then we have that cooperation of inviting private sector rep representatives to teach at the school selected subjects. Then we are cooperating with the private sector when it comes to job placement activities. So you see there is a whole variety of, of, of different approaches which are varying quite a, a bit. But I think the essential one is the definition of a curriculum together with the private sector. So the school actually produces a graduate which is really uh, in line with the needs of the, of the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now end the floor to Ken, please. Thanks, Robert, for facilitating our question and answer. So um, to our audience, please allow us to go a little bit over time. We may finish a little bit after 12, um, 1230 in one time. Um, so I will now invite our uh, discussant, Father Brian Butanas from the Don Bosco um, Technical uh, Vocational mm -hmm. Education Center in the Philippines for his reflections. Um, he is going to share with us a different type of cooperation, partnership, and engagement. Um, Father Butanas, please, uh, the floor is yours for four minutes. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to render the reflection and the presentations. Uh, of course, Mr. Ricardo presented the trends in business restructuring, impacting skills and jobs rich potentials, addressing the challenges and of introducing propane-based air conditioners into the market and with its standards and skilled technicians. Uh, the, it's a curricula based uh, in, on industry demand. Uh, also, Sir Janaka shared on modeling multi-stakeholder engagement in NACA policy and forecasting labor market needs for greening vocational training in energy and construction sectors, aligning existing jobs with green competencies. Uh, Dr. Adrian Ang also speaks of a special specialist diploma for technicians on refrigerant handling, giving also an overview of the Integrative Built Environment Center for lifelong relevant learning. Uh, Mr. Martin delivered a report on a renewable energy skills development project for polytechnics and training providers in Indonesia connecting private sector with employers association and sector association. Uh, well, here in the Philippines, uh, along with 18 Don Bosco TVET centers, we envision that we become a benchmark and premier provider of technical vocational education founded on the teachings of St. John Bosco. Our missions are to form students in the Salesian educational system, making them good Christians and honest, upright citizens, and to develop and train students who are highly qualified and globally competitive, and to produce, provide quality technical education to the poor and underprivileged youth for gainful employment. 
the desire to integrate a green pivot center with the current welding program, technology program, directed us also to venture into bamboo production as, as its benefits to climate change and impact to local environment and also its value chain. So we partnered with the Kabili Nature Farm and Bamboo Center with Father Big Labo as our main resource for lectures and workshops with our trainers, faculty and staff. All these programs are geared towards to enhance the capability of the center and to develop the training programs based on the training regulations set by the government or the PESDA. A uh, significant also partnership is, is with the Junior Chamber International, the Metro Cebu Uptown, which guarantees continued networking with their partners, companies, and particularly in the construction and poultry sector, thus assuring that the deserving young people employed and equipped with proper knowledge, skills, and attitudes aligned to their industry and also to their advocacy. Uh, enrollment of the trainees as to high probability of employment. Uh, the secret we, uh, we wanted to share is that uh, it's values-driven, multi-skilled, and environmentally responsible individuals. This give, gave our TVET trainees sustainable employment despite the challenging times of the pandemic. The TVET Center originally intended to support the needs of the shipbuilding industry Main, mainly on welding. The pandemic has affected the industry, diminishing the demand for potential employment. Well, despite the setback, we, we saw an opportunity in the booming construction industry because of the Build, Build, Build program of the Philippine government. Fortunately, prior to the pandemic, we were able to establish linkages with construction companies and various poultry farms to provide employ their employment needs that the shipbuilding industry has left us in void. So with this gain knowledge and also strengthened partnerships, the center, we came up with three batches, all integrated the bundled content program on construction building, which consists of welding as their uh, foundational skill with basic electricity, masonry, carpentry, and scaffolding erection. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, besides the content-based discussion on these topics, all trainees perform hands-on work on the bamboo nursery doing plant rehabilitation, nursery uh, preparation on propagules, maintaining nursery stocks, plant bamboo stocks, and also harvesting and other operations related to bamboo. Uh, looking ahead, the uh, Tivet Center proposes an expansion of the training program, not only to their existing work for workers, but also to the trainees. Similarly, a training will also include welding, electrical, and masonry and scaffolding, and bamboo production. Uh, this, will, this, will allow them, uh, this will allow us to be more sustainable, and we also, uh, we know that a green worker is more employable worker, and this uh, we, have, we were able to, to, to see it with the three batches that we had. And a green workforce will enhance the profitability also of our partners, uh, which our last slide would, would show also. Last slide, please. This is our, our proposal of our program that a worker who, is, uh, who works for, for the environment with construction and uh, related skills that is needed for the jobs. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Father Botanas, for sharing with us um, how you are trying to manage the challenges of the pandemic, but also at the same time, make sure that your Tibet programs are still trying to respond with the sectors or subsectors that are actually offering jobs uh, at the community level and how you are trying to work with these different actors, stakeholders, and um, companies that, that are willing to support your mission. So I think at this point, it, it has been really a very enriching and a fruitful uh, uh, sharing of the experiences. Um, if you have uh, perhaps any question uh, to Father Botanas, uh, if you want to know more, of course, you can always 
uh, contact him. We have we will provide and share with you all the contact information of our panelists. Um, I will now share with uh, Robert again, our co-moderator, in case you have any final questions, Robert, before we move to close the session. Um, thank you. I think one of the, um, I'll, um, all of you, the presenters, uh, panelists have highlighted the, the, the alignment issue uh, from your uh, policy, from at institutional level and at the ministry level from Janaka to alignment with the, the national um, strategy and uh, medium and long-term plans on sustainable development. Uh, I think uh, that is a very uh, uh, important aspect with the UN system of monitoring the alignment uh, of um, the green skills, TVET, uh, employment, unemployment, a whole, whole strange of related issues aligned with the uh, national sustainable development uh, agenda. So if one of you could really highlight maybe Janaka or uh, Martin could highlight uh, uh, this important aspect of it. Martin, you can go. That's not really my level of where I fly. Yes. I, I am rather at the institutional level yeah. than at the political one. Uh, probably that would be the better, the better one for you. OK, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, when it uh, comes to the policy level, uh, uh, yeah, we have to consider the, the stakeholder waves and uh, the implementer the interpretability and uh, what are the, uh, the ecosystem concerns when we are going to uh, go with this kind of uh, plan. And uh, also considering the, the stakeholder views, so some of the uh, concerns of uh, implementing uh, such plans in, uh, at the uh, ground level has to be considered uh, at the policy level because uh, just if we do the policy right, but if we cannot implement, there's an issue. Because of that, uh, we need to bring all the stakeholders in, uh, on table and see what is the uh, feasible solution for particular issues at, uh, at various levels. So that, uh, that was the exercise that we have done for the policy development, uh, uh, the, because in the main policy, we have uh, greening elements embedded in our policy directives. So I think, uh, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, Ken? Yes. Thank you so much, um, Robert and all our colleagues. So at this point, we will, our World Skills colleagues mentioned that we need to take a photo um, before we close the session. So I will invite everyone to please uh, make sure your videos are on. Our colleagues will uh, put a gallery mode to the Zoom so we can see everyone. And while we do that, I would like to thank everyone for all their contributions. This is not the last uh, conversation that we will have. I'm very sure about that. And we will perhaps visit, revisit one, two years from now um, how your projects, initiatives have progressed and see what we can further share with each other and, and learn or draw from the experiences that you have uh, implemented. So in Singapore, it's really good to see the program at the heart of this greening strategy. And we hope that your IBEC, the work of the IBEC, the uh, Build Center will really be a success so that we can also further showcase this with other Univox centers in the region. The Janaka has always been part of our community and always active in, in and supportive of our UNESCO um, 
Tibet uh, strategy. So we hope to also be able to learn more from the experiences in Sri Lanka. Um, our colleague from uh, the Philippines, he is currently uh, implementing or the Tibet, uh, the Don Bosco College is implementing uh, projects that is also going to be supported by the ILO in the Philippines. And we really look forward to see how the greening of uh, Don Bosco Tibet centers will, um, uh, will become a success and we further want to share the experiences and, and learn from that. Um, do we have the gallery view? All right, so... Um, Okay, let's smile and all right. I hope our colleagues at World Skills International have done their job there. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, we just have to say maybe one word from Ricardo and one from Robert, and we are going to close this session. Ricardo, please. Thank you, Ken. I just <clears throat> would like to, usually when we have these uh, virtual meetings, we say it's not really what counts uh, the meeting itself, but the journey going into the meeting, right? I mean, because we always have a technical issues. I mean, this time we didn't have any technical issues, but still the journey that brought us today here was really interesting. And thank you, Ken, because you handle the coordination also with uh, with our host, the, the, the World Skills International, very professionally. And uh, Ken, has been really a pleasure. So looking forward to cooperating in future again. Thank you, Ricardo. Pleasure thank working you. with you and the team. Robert? Thank you, Ken. Thank you, uh, World Skills. Thank you, Yonido, and thank you all our panelists for your uh, presentation. Uh, and I really enjoyed the session today. And uh, I hope to see you again in in the next foreseeable future in one of the Green Skills um, uh, discussions again. And uh, as we know, Green Skills is a is a team of work in progress. So we need to continue to discuss, find solutions, looking at partnerships, um, and continue to build a very strong uh, foundation. And as we said, you're coming from institute, you need to build a very strong institutional culture uh, for, for greening skills. And as we say in um, TVET and UNESCO, greening the campus, greening the curriculum and training, greening research, greening the community and workplace, and greening institutional culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. And all the best for the work you are doing in our uh, Beijing cluster office. So you are also working with a lot of countries in that uh, part of the world. So all the best. And all the best to our colleagues, Martin, Father Brian, Dr. Adrian, Ricardo, and Janaka. Thanks a lot. And thanks to World Skills International, Judith, for all this uh, uh, opportunities that you have given us and thanks to all our participants for your time and for uh, uh, joining us learn about all these experts that we have in the session. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you, Redak, Ricardo, Brian, Martin, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Janaka, bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Ken. Uh...